Hello, and welcome to As Depicted on Film. All right, but apart from the sanitation, the medicine, education, wine, public order, irrigation, roads, the fresh water system and public health, what have the Romans ever done for us? Hi, everybody. Welcome to As Depicted on Film. Hello, Rutger. Hey, Gil. How are you? Ooh. So we got to watch the two final episodes of House of the Dragon. And now we have the work complete. Mm, this season, yeah. This season. So I'm really, really looking forward to break it down. And what we want to focus on is the role chance plays in shaping history because the three biggest events that pushed the realm to this civil war were chance events. Mm -hmm. They just happened. And you, later you'll give some uh, really big chance events in history. And here we have three in succession. In episode eight, the king Viserys is confused. He's dying. He says, he thinks his wife is his, do is his daughter. He tells her something. There's a misunderstanding. And that leads to his son being coronated instead of the princess, Rhaenyra. So mm -hmm. that's just like by chance. Yep. In, ep in episode nine, there's uh, by chance the the the, uh, the princess, the queen that never was, the grandmother on the dragon. She doesn't kill them. She bursts out. Finally, Hillary is back. <laughs> she was right all along, <laughs> and she's here with a vengeance, but not enough vengeance. <laughs> yeah, but then, like, I'm not going to be the first one that fights, but they just imprisoned you. And threatened you. Yeah. You, you could be the first and the last one who fights and just yes. wrap it up right there. Boom, done. When you were watching this, I, I guess we were all like, okay, here we go. Dracarys. <laughs> right? And also the people on the stage, they were like, oh, kind of squinting, yes. like, oh, shit, here we go. And then nothing. And then just Anticlimactic. Nothing. Anticlimactic. Yeah. So it just happened. And she just flies off. Another chance event. Yeah. And now the season concluded with a third straight chance event. Yep. The eye patch dragon rider Targaryen. His dragon killed the boy and his dragon, the Rhaenerys' boy, but he didn't mean to. No. And they, the things could have unfolded so different. They could have sent ravens. They could have just had a little horseplay with the dragons up in the sky, but then the big dragon would have not got so pissed off by the little one. He could have not followed him. His dragon sure. could have been more relaxed. It just happened. Yeah. yeah. So three chance events in a row. Okay, so I think this is very, very flawed storytelling. But first, let's talk about... Well, it's flawed storytelling, but it is kind of accurate history in a way. Okay, go on. And so, so this is okay. So this is the part where we do like George R. R. Martin uh, with his templating of of events, you know, on modeling them on history. Like when, you know, in Game of Thrones in season one, uh, we are set up for a civil war which kind of resembles the War of the Roses. And, you know, the king dies. And why does he die? Well, he just had a hunting accident. And, yeah. you know, that happens. Like, he mm. just he slightly too angry wild boar. And uh, ow, ow, ow. And there you go. But, but it was also, there was some agency in it that he was given wine. And he was made, like, he was pushed maybe to that. And he was reckless also. He's yeah. a reckless person. Sure, sure, sure. sure. He, he was whining and dining himself to an early grave anyway. So... Sure, but still, like, shit happens. That was basically the setup. And here, so, the again, uh, George R. R. Martin kind of models events loosely, obviously, on, on uh, existing history. And supposedly this time it's kind of modeled on uh, a, a, a period in history called the Anarchy. Never heard of it. I also hadn't, so we're now just going straight off of what Wikipedia has to say. So the anarchy was a civil war. Wikipedia, but put it in context, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So 
the anarchy was also a civil war also in uh, the history of the British Isles but a little bit earlier so this is a civil war that kind of spanned uh, England and Normandy uh, and the war started in 1138 so this is like uh, you know 70 years after the initial conquest of Britain by the Normans right so right, which so are like the William, Hungarian like in this exactly situation. so William the Conqueror just like Aegon the Conqueror crosses the waters and then uh, conquers the big isle in this case the British Isles and is uh and he unites that starts to unite the king yes so then there's a realm that kind of spans both sides of the uh, of the channel also something that b- later became known as the anjouin empire because it's the house of anjou which was both <laughs> in france and in britain um, and so here now we also kind of have this setup where you have both targaryens who are in the british isles slash westeros and you've got like uh, you know uh, strongholds on the other side of the channel, and you know yeah. they all f- play a part in this civil war, which was precipitated in history by the accidental death of William Adlin, who was uh, the heir to the throne of this House of Anjou. Uh, but then, oops, he was dead, and now uh, you know chance event, and uh, hence uh, civil war. And, w- and what happened? How did the civil war conclude? Well, there was uh, campaigns on uh, on different sides. There was, um, you know, also in Normandy, there was fighting. Uh, there was actually an invasion out of the British Isles into Normandy by uh, Geoffrey of Anjou. Um, there was kind of a stalemate for a long time because, like, the war starts in 1138 and sort of concludes by 1153 so it's kind of a long 20 uh, years war yep and um, it's called the anarchy because there was of course widespread breakdown in law and order (laughs) so Mm. i guess that's what we have to look forward to in the coming seasons so the chance death of the heir right led to a series of events that might have been avoided sure had uh, accepted the heir would have stayed alive right uh, okay so we l- looked at also the rings of power and we were very gushing over the very sy- symbolic storytelling which is the exact opposite of this like there was the inevitability of the rise of sauron again and all these different forces that are uh, kind of agents of more like a, a morality you know it's like a morality play mm. which we like uh, and here it's the sa- the exact opposite. Like this is the nihilistic worldview of George R. R. Martin. And here just shit happens for no good reason. Like boom, uh, and all of a sudden horrendous war, which is actually like how things happen in history more often than we would like. I think there aren't a lot of historical uh, processes that have nearly as much chance event, complete chance events as as we have in this story. But more than that. I think that chance events make for great anecdotes, Mm -hmm. like, for example, the story that you just told uh, about the anarchy, and the stories that we'll uh, we'll keep talking about uh, Mm -hmm. in a moment. When you connect chance events, they don't make a story. It's just a, a chain of chance events. You have to have the story that preceded the chance event like this air dying and then what happened later but if it's just like all these weird things happen for no reason then it's 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 not a good story mm. maybe there's a good example uh, <laughs> of a war that makes a really bad story right yep these chance events they only happen at the micro scale like between individuals and that's like it's family drama and this is kind of also what we'd been complaining about early on in the season that it's like little low stakes family drama and at some level the trigger for example of the first world war is also kind of weird family drama but also at the same time of course there's very large scale socioeconomic processes gradually like the, the industrialization of germany 
uh, you know, the court yeah. events in Russia since 1905. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the zero sum game of this world where if you want something, you have to take it for somebody yeah. else. And it started because of a chance event, an extremely unlikely event, the way that the Duke Ferdinand was murdered, was assassinated, a complete chance event. His assassin gave up yeah. on assassinating yeah. him and then just like saw his car where he was eating his dinner or something. Yeah. And the driver got confused with, uh, with his car and then he just went in and shot him. Just like a complete chance event. It's part of what makes the, the story of the First World War a really bad story that still 100 years after it, it's incomprehensible and it's really hard to wrap our heads around what happened, no. why it happened. And I think that this is also the case for House of the Dragon season one. Yeah, it's, it's weird that like the world of uh, 1914 was on the one hand a world where these really weird like one-on-one -on -one encounters still mattered. Like the, the great land empires of Eurasia were all like personal fiefs of, of families and the families were also very closely related. Like the, the British and the Germans and the Russians were all the grandchildren of, of Queen Victoria. And over the course of the war, the German emperor uh, Wilhelm and the Russian Tsar Nicholas were sending each other letters. Dear Willy, dear Nikki. As, as their <laughs> countries were fighting. While, they're, while they're, their people were going into the meat yeah. grinder... And it's all set off by, okay, so, so the Archduke goes to Sarajevo, and he was actually kind of pro-Bosnian interest. He wasn't that, such a hard ass. So he's also taking it easy with his open car. And then, you know, the assassin does the first attempt, fails, goes have a sandwich. Wow. <laughs> and while he's eating his sandwich, the open car of the prince or the archduke, you know, with, with not a lot of cops around it because he thought he was popular, <laughs> <laughs> basically backs into the terrace to make a turn while they're driving. And then, you know, the assassin gets up, shoots him. And here we are today. Yeah, and, and exactly, with events that are still shaped by, by what happened then. But it only makes sense if you both consider that instability of these personal dynasties uh, and on the other right. hand, these, these large sort of developments that we just talked about, also things like technological development, the, the, the dreadnought class. Like the situation was unsustainable. Something had to yes. give also the Turks, the Ottomans were on the decline and the people were after yeah. their territories. So hot take. Let me do a, give a hot take <laughs> on the World War I and okay. World War II. I'm focusing on the stories. Maybe part of the reason that Germany later became what it was was because mm. the story of World War I was so incomprehensible that basically it was begging people to try and explain what had happened why this senseless series of events happened? Why did so many people die? Why? We have to have a reason. You have to give us a reason. Mm -hmm. What's the reason? It's these people. They caused us yeah. to lose. And like, if, if you have a, a traumatic event that you can't wrap your heads around, you know, like you have the Holocaust, a, tra like a, tra a big traumatic event. You can make sense of it. There was anti-Semitism, there was nationalism, uh, Jews were always the other. The okay. But when you have a traumatic event that you can't explain, it's, it's like your mind is in distress and is grasping for every straw. Just give me a story. So you have today anti-vaxxers because we, we have to have a story. We're desperate. We cannot, our brains cannot function if we don't have a story to make sense of the world. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's so hard to fathom that all these millions of people have died around the world because, you know, maybe because a bat did fuck a pangolin or something. Like that. I mean, okay, that's uh, right. So, so, so ah, just the whole yeah. pandemic is also really hard to explain yeah. in people's heads. There must have been... Yeah like some agent behind it, like, oh, the evil Chinese with their lab experiments or the World Economic Forum with the Great Reset. And of course, you know, if it's like rootless cosmopolitans, pretty soon 
that those minds end up you know pointing at the jews because that's just kind of like uh, if it's just an yeah. inexplicable event there yeah. must have been some cabal behind it yeah. pulling the strings which is not the case there was a cabal pulling the strings uh, but not in the way that they portray it it was known that this was going to happen sometime or another i read about it 10 years earlier the scientists said that the growing industrialization and, and encroachment of the natural world and animal habitat it will lead to a pandemic i remember reading about it you know in the guardian or whatever it was 10 years before before that when, when bill gates did his ted talk tour he was quoting what scientists were saying he wasn't doing anything but but talking about what other people uh, were, were telling us was going to happen so this is a good story. <laughs> well, and we made we we made a pandemics in movies episode before the pandemic, right? Right. <laughs> it's not as if this is like a totally unexpected event. Like if you right. paid attention a little bit, you know that we're, yes. we were living on borrowed time. It's going to happen. So if I take it back to the show, the story, the show has to lean into something. If you want to say that history is shaped by chance events okay that's a perspective mm -hmm. it can work mm -hmm. lean into it not just make every episode have this ah chance event no. it just happened 50 50 no. because that's ha that's a collection of anecdotes yeah. it's not a story you wanna you wanna say a few chance events shape history okay focus on how like the incomprehensibility of, of the magnitude of chance events and how it's so hard to wrap your head around it. That's, that can be good storytelling. Mm -hmm. Just pointing, oh, look, this happened. Oh, look, here, this happened. But with dragons. <laughs> this is not a story. It's, no. it's, it's not a story. Yeah. As you said uh, to me yeah. many times. And, and then, and then, and then. Exactly. And then. <laughs> Yeah. And then this happened, and then this happened like yeah, a child. Yeah, tennis. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, like a good set, like, okay, I mean, good storytelling. So, not just emulating history, but good storytelling is that you kind of set up, you know, in, in episode one, a Chekhov's gun, and then you're working towards the fatal gunshot, yeah. and, and that's how you tell the story. And if it's like every episode, there's another Deus Ex Machina, and like, oh, this is an unexpected turn of events. <laughs> okay, it's a little numbing, isn't it? <laughs> It is numbing. Like, it's cool when you tell this, as an, again, as a historical anecdote. So you have three anecdotes about Hitler. Yes. Let's go over these anecdotes. They're really interesting as, an, as anecdotes, but when we try to make a story out of them, our brain breaks. Yes, and, and his brain broke, didn't it? Like, so yes. he escaped <laughs> death a bunch of times, uh, you know, like, for example, at the, the Beer Hall Putsch, uh, uh, like in the early 20s in Munich, and like the Nazis thought they were ready to seize power, and then turned out they like weren't. Their January six moment. <laughs> exactly, like a total failure. And uh, in this case, the German cops did shoot back, and he was shot, but uh, not quite in the right spot because he lived to tell the tale. Yeah. Uh, but very close to his heart, like I don't know, the shoulder or something. I don't remember the exact, uh, you know, wh where exactly in his body, but it was like a few centimeters. Yeah. Just like oh, chance event. Yeah. Event. And, and of course that's already like kind of hinted to, uh, in his mind that oh maybe I'm predestined because I'm still yes. here and then other times uh, so there was like a, a, like a, the second one yeah. is little known I only learned about it when I read the, uh, his biography and I, I don't know I, you know what I understand why it's little known because it's it's not a good story you know, it's a good story as an anecdote but it's just disturbing yeah. there was this person who wasn't even that political but he understood who Hitler was before 95% of the people understood who he was. We don't know how, we don't know why. And he planned, he had an amazing plan by no. himself. That's such a weird story. And he went to where Hitler was going to give his beer uh, putsch uh, annual uh, speech. No. Went to the pillar just behind the stage, put a bomb, tested it several times, just like the weirdest thing That's ever. That's like Unabomber shit. Just, uh, Unabomber shit, he timed it, but... By chance, Hitler didn't feel that well, so he finished his speech quickly, went back to the train, the bomb went off, killed like 20 people that were there because the thing collapsed. 
And the guy was arrested on the train to, I don't know where, was arrested. And then he was, you know, kept in the internment camp for like uh, five years. But complete chance event that you can't make sense of. Yeah. And the third one is more famous. The third one is the uh, the, the Valkyrie, uh, uh, the Stauffenberg uh, attack, where again a bomb, and this time in one of the bunkers. And again, like a chance event, this was totally supposed to finish him. There was a pretty heavy bomb, uh, but Stauffenberg placed it just on the at the wrong side of the table, where there was a yeah. little bit of uh, like protection, so the blast didn't quite hit uh, Hitler hard enough. I think like the TNT, one of them didn't work, so he took them out. But if he, he would have kept in, he kept it in, so it would have exploded because of the other TNT, and then just weird random events. Yeah. So three. So now try to make sense of this story yeah. as a story. These three random events. How can you connect them? I can. Uh, Hitler could. So uh, so this is you know <laughs> this is how the the the, the, yeah. the fucked up mind operates versus what what the big trends are like hitler thought well now i'm for sure you know chosen by providence i'm on a mission from god let's go like mussolini came to visit him after the stauffenberg attack i think on the same day mm. and they, mm. so they, there's these famous photos where they where hitler shows mussolini like look i just survived this and Mussolini, of course, was also this terrified, like, what the fuck, Whoa. this guy's still here. <laughs> <laughs> so Hitler told the story that this all means something. Sure. But it didn't mean anything. No, no, uh, he, <laughs> was, he, he, was, he was still, later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Finally, uh, yeah, yeah. But what it, does it mean? What does it mean? These, these three chance events, if you tell Hitler's story with these three chance events, this is why also Hitler's story is incomprehensible. Yeah. How this loser became uh, the ruler of uh, Europe. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, it's weird, but it's, uh, it's, I guess it's also then, you know, what is the I inevitability of a person like that riding the tiger because, well, Germany was really revengeist and traumatized by the first world war and there was still these economic inequalities like the potential of the large german state so it was going to rebuild anyhow yeah. quickly yeah. yeah um so like he just happened to have sl you know slipped through but it could have equally been some other nationalist would yeah. have done something or similar. a communist maybe or a communist yeah but like the, just the, the inequalities in like the developmental trajectories of the different states yeah. and sort of mass psychology about resentment yeah. over the loss etc yeah it's probably pretty inevitable anyway yeah yeah now knowing now we know that capitalists and conservatives if they ha if they have to choose between a fascist and a communist they will always uh, choose the fascist mm -hmm which they did and which we, we keep seeing uh, today, like uh, many people prefer fascism over not even communism, like socialism or just like higher taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. Like yeah. <laughs> Give me a dictator with lower taxes than a democracy. Not even higher taxes. taxes, not lowering taxes. That is already enough to make the move to fascism. <laughs> if my exactly. taxes aren't cut, then I guess I'm going to have to become a fascist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or fund fund the fascist. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, let's contrast that, what we just talked about now, contrast that with Game of Thrones season one. Yeah. Season one of Game of Thrones and season one of House of the Dragon are a very, very similar story. It's a story about a kingdom in peace, but a faux peace, a false peace. War is brewing underneath, and the show and the season is concluded with the civil war starting. The first shot, boom, of the civil war. So in Game of Thrones, the civil war was also inevitable, right? Because the Starks are not smart, are not shrewd. Mm -hmm. They play. They don't play the game by the same rules as the Lannisters, so it's inevitable that they will lose. Inevitable. There's always a chance that it won't happen. But this is a good story. Like the good people, if they don't do politics well and are not smart, will always lose to the bad people because bad people 
usually do politics better mm-hmm. because they are more manipulative. Well, and the greater economic power of the Lannisters. Yeah. Right? They were very rich. Uh, yeah. But they played their hand better because Ned could have told the king before that his wife and uh, cheated on him and his son and his children are not his children. He mm. could have said that. But that doesn't feel like a chance event. It feels like a natural consequence of the character that is uh, Ned Stark, right? We, we understand why he did it, and we thought it was a good idea at the time because we were with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But only then it's like, ah, uh, but it doesn't feel random. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But here, these events, is like, why did the grandmother dragon rider not kill him mm-hmm. and everybody? Why? I don't know. I'm... Why did why did these two animals just get upset with each other? Right? Yeah, the that dragons. wasn't really set up that dragons dislike each other and like oh, that it could happen. I think I think, it, I think the idea is also that like the, the kid is not a Targaryen, so he's slightly less in control of his dragon because of the mystic bond between dragons and Targaryens. Yeah. And then the the little dragon gets a little feisty and kind of oh. attacks the big one a little bit, and then then the big one just asserts dominance and bites the other one in half, and that's that. Okay. Yeah. But nothing cool. to do with like. <laughs> so I guess the difference is with, with the Starks and the, the season one of of Game of Thrones. There's kind of like a predestination in the characters of the people. Yeah. And and these are just like random things in this in and this we season. are fooled together with them which is a very effective storytelling yeah huh. do we have more chance events uh well uh with the chance events i guess it matters that it's like in a, a very small circle of people like it, uh, chance events only happen at the at the small scale and not at the, the macro scale and we had a, a funny chance event that might have involved involved multiple people, but most likely just involved one person, which is the uh, the uh, event of uh, George Martinovic, um, huh? uh, who was uh, a Serbian uh, hmm. living in uh, Kosovo uh, in the 80s. And he uh, presented at the uh, emergency room with a broken bottle uh, up his uh, bottom. And uh, he said that he was uh, had been attacked and angrily raped by evil Albanians, but it probably just was a, a, a sexual mishap, <laughs> uh, self-inflicted uh, most likely. Yeah, um, no. and uh, and that of course further ratcheted up the tensions between Serbians and Albanians. And then in the minds of the Serbians, it's like, oh, they're doing it again because Albanians, in their view, are like the Turks, which is inaccurate. And the Turks always did these impalements. So you see Muslim the bottle. The, yeah, yeah, exactly. So did you see this bottle? They're, they're back at it again, you know, impaling our men. And they're not with poles, but with bottles. But still, look how horrific they are, those Muslims. And wow. If only, if only that, that Martinovic dude had just said, oh, I slipped and fell on the bottle. Instead of having to involve right. these Albanians, then it would have been fine. <laughs> yes. Well, probably still War of the Balkans, but uh, it, at least this wouldn't have contributed to ratcheting up the tensions. So, so okay, so let's go over our chance events. If Hitler would have died at any one of those yeah. points, even the earlier ones, fascism would have survived in some way, right? It, would have been, it wouldn't have been eradicated just because he's dead, right? Uh, mm-hmm. All the tensions that were before uh, the f- the First World War started, yeah. and the uh, Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated, the, all the piece were, pieces were set for something to happen. It doesn't have to be a First World War, but something major. This is how all these chance events, like the role that they play, is that they either increase or decrease magnitude of something that was already brewing yeah. and going to happen anyway. Like, I guess the biggest chance event that you could have is uh, this uh, Soviet guy who didn't destroy the world with nuclear weapons. 
This is a truly chance event by one person, 50%, like he was told that uh, the American, by some malfunction, that the Americans were <laughs> shooting uh, nuclear missiles, so he didn't <laughs> click, yeah. which he was supposed to click the button and then we're all, yeah. we're all dead. This is a really chance event. I hope he's trained other Russians. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, no. <laughs> so here it's just like, I don't understand... The sto- like the story could have been mm. these dragons are a menace and they represent something ambition uh, you know uh, vanity mm. unchecked power something it represents that but everybody's bored low energy even the lord of the stormlands is bored to get an offer from the queen huh it's like you know there's a negotiations to form a coalition and the, mo- mm. the person that everybody wants, uh, wants them to join their coalition, he's wooed and courted. And he's like, oh, this is so boring. Everybody <laughs> wants me to join their coalition and they're offering me things. <laughs> so, why is he bored there on his chair? I don't understand this. Huh. It's like their creators are bored with their own story. I don't, this, I don't understand this. Why? Why is this boredom? Why does it keep popping up with so many major characters? I guess it kind of speaks also to uh, something that I don't think we really talked about in recordings, uh, but which we noticed, which is that the the world, the world of uh, George R. R. Martin is a world that s- says about itself that there's such frequent chaos and turnover and and fighting and our chaos is a letter and the Game of Thrones you either. Uh, win or you die, yada, yada, yada. But at the same time, actually those Targaryens have been on the throne for quite a while. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, if you if you add up the generations, they have sat on the throne for longer than the House of Orange in Holland, for example. <laughs> and, and that doesn't <laughs> seem like a super chaotic, unstable situation. So maybe in their heads they thought, well, for now, now it's finally time because after all, we are a society where you constantly have these wars. Or I, I, they were getting bored maybe with the stasis because it was actually more static than they tell themselves. You know, Maybe, okay, hot take. Maybe this is what this story is about. First of all, something that is not a hot, uh, hot take that I thought about. I think that King Viserys mm-hmm. is inspired by... George R. R. Martin's perception of Jimmy Carter. Mm-hmm. Okay. I happened to watch for some reason, I don't remember, George R. R. Martin commenting on Jimmy Carter, mm-hmm. how he was maybe seen as weak and not appreciated, but during his time, no American bullet was ever shot, mm-hmm. which is amazing. <laughs> no. But with all due, due, respect to Jimmy Carter as a historical figure is of no consequence. No. He's only relevant to people who grew up in the United States when George R. R. Martin grew up. Mm. He's not a grand historical figure from whom you can gain insights into how people rule throughout the generations. Mm. No, 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 no. It's very local and very, very specific. A post-war thing when the boom, economic boom, was uh, winding down. Come on. So Viserys is, you know, he's peaceful. He's weak. You take that and you add that to maybe post-Cold War thinking, like everybody's nihilistic and bored and rich 90s. Money going everywhere, TV, you know, he sees all like a, like a decadent uh, world uh, of elite that doesn't know that it is planting the seeds of its own destruction, which we are seeing right now. Mm. But if this is a story, I don't know if this is what he meant, but if this is what he meant, then if you lean into it, it can be a good story. But it's... Uh, it's just it should it should have stayed as anecdotes, like out of focused history, mm. out of focus history. If you zoom into it, no, no. 
like these anecdotes they're they're super fun i, I like them a lot like uh you know, uh, the Aeschylus dies because a, uh, a bird of prey carries a turtle and throws it on his head because it thinks his head is a rock. And then one of the great playwrights of Greek antiquity dies because of this weird freak event. Okay, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like, you know, and, and there's like history is full of these anecdotes, but they're not the thing that shapes history. And they don't tell that much also about like the, the the human condition of these characters, like the way Aeschylus dies doesn't tell you anything like what he was like. Right. Right. So so it, so in, in good storytelling, in good art, you want to somehow say something about what humans are like or what drives them or you right. know, what drives history. And these anecdotes don't have anything to do with that. They're just freak events. Right, right, right. So we can take this this exact story, like, you know, change very, very little. Just move it a little bit, the events here or there, and then these chance events will tell a story. Yeah. Maybe even a story about chance events. There's this film Magnolia, have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, where like you have these different characters and, uh, and ultimately it sort of climate, climaxes with this weird rain of frogs. And like this, these anecdotes woven into it, like the one where there's the forest fire and they found somebody in scuba gear in the middle of the forest fire. Well, that's because the plane picks up the water. And, uh, and, and the lesson of the film is that these things sometimes happen. Like at the end of the film, also a kid says that, like, oh, these things sometimes happen. Yeah. And that's true. And that's, that's a, a nice topic to reflect upon. Yes, and I but, think that like uh, good chance events, I mean positive chance events, are fun to listen to because it makes you feel as if the world is good. Mm. It's like, oh, I ran into on the street of the cousin of my cousin who both knew each other when they traveled. I don't know, something like that. You feel, oh, there is meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. in a, it's like the chance event actually feels not like a chance event. No. <laughs> Uh, it makes sense of the million chance events that you have in your life. You're like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, exactly. What is my story? It's like, oh, the cousin of the cousin that was, oh, okay, now I know that there is meaning and purpose. Yeah. So it's actually, it's interesting. It's like the opposite. But okay, go on. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It, well, I don't have much to go on, except that like we like to attach meaning to them because it's so weird that chance events happen. Yes. In that sense, we are just like Hitler, who, <laughs> <laughs> who, who thought that this was all very meaningful when it's just like stochastic events, you know. You know, you know there was a <laughs> there was a Palestinian uh, terrorist. I don't remember which one of them it is, but he's been fired at by the Israeli military like a gazillion times and survived miraculously. You know, lost his leg, his hand, his eye. And he thought also that it means something, but then he died later. <laughs> was that uh, Sheikh uh, Yassin? No, 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 no. It was something that, like, like his car was bombed and he just like, <laughs> crawled and the helicopter missed him. Something weird, uh -huh. something weird that he felt, oh, I was, it means something. But then it ended up just not to mean anything because he just died later. That's, uh, that, is, that is the definition of survivorship bias, isn't it? Like <laughs> many other Palestinian terrorists were just hit the first time. <laughs> That's right, and taken out of the game. They never uh, got the chance to think that about themselves. Well, survivor <laughs> bias, I, I, I heard a very funny joke. Where I don't remember the name of the comedian about the whole view on the pandemic uh, is basically survival bias. Like, that yeah. wasn't so bad. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> For you, okay, wasn't so for bad. you, <laughs> you are alive. <laughs> <laughs> How many million of people, millions of people died? Loads, and still going on. Yeah. Millions, yeah. millions. Like if we, uh, if someone would have told us like ten years ago, in ten years there's gonna be a pandemic and uh, ten million people will die, twenty million people. Like, wow. Yeah. But and now we've like, just oh. sat, you know, watching Netflix and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's and eating so takeout, and it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's fine. That's horrific, yeah. Actually, I was I, I had a pretty nasty COVID, like pretty like the nastiest, the worst illness I've ever had was the COVID. Huh? Oh. Yeah, wow, 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 brutal, brutal. 
Never felt anything like that in the world. But you know what? It's not so bad. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, maybe anecdotes. Let's uh, let's finish with anecdotes because I have a you know a list of uh, things from the from the episode, okay. the two episodes. So again, this recurring theme of poor, poor, poor billionaires mm. who have it so tough. Yeah. King Aegon, he has no wish to rule. No. Poor, poor guy. But then he has a wish to rule just like a 30 seconds later. <laughs> but he didn't want it. No, I don't want it. But the girl boss thing is ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. Ridiculous. Like, are we supposed, oh my goodness, a female dictator. Yes, yes. <laughs> She's a better dictator. Yeah. What is this? What is this? Yeah, we like to continue to believe that. And we've just seen Liz Truss. <laughs> like it, they're, they're not better. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is underreported, I think, the Liz Truss. By the mere fact that she was talking about plans, libertarian <laughs> plans, just like every like. Ew, there goes, there goes the economy. Oh yeah. my goodness, they are crazy, it is crazy. And it's just a completely underreported, like this is an incredible narrative. No. This is bogus voodoo economics. No. This is just like make-believe. The moment yeah. you give these people power, yeah. Ay, ay, ay. Lefties don't know how to tell good stories. No. I don't want to complain too much because we already have, but it's, uh, like, it's weird what motivates these people. Like... You know, the girl boss moment, she comes through the floor on the dragon, awesome, 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 then doesn't kill the others, even though this was the perfect opportunity, flies off, and then to the uh, to, to her others to say, to talk about how we are going to kill all of them, right? Like, the, the, why did, like, if that was your intent anyway... Have, have this was the plan that somebody else needs to do it for her because it's a little bit gross to do it right then and there or like i don't know yeah, yeah she doesn't want to besmirch her her honor yeah like guys you you fix it now that was a weird <laughs> and and so that was i mean okay so there's i guess this sequence of events that just lead up to it also by people making mistakes or like not really you know, finishing the job. Also, why didn't Prince uh, Eyepatch uh, f- finish his brother when they were had the whole yeah. fight? That could have solved a lot if that was just... No, no, it, like he felt clearly it was his chance and his right. And, and his brother wanted him moment. to have it. Then do it now. This is the moment. <laughs> like, again, like why did that... Okay, you know what? I want to go back to the girl boss moment with the dragon. Mm-hmm. So she lost both her children. And she has two, three granddaughters. And all of them are married to the family of Rhaenerys. Mm. Like their lives depend on Rhaenerys winning. Yep. So if she just says Dracarys, then her granddaughters are safe. Yeah. They will get to live in the Red Keep and everything will be fine. No worries. Yeah. Problem solved. But no, she's like, okay, I want my granddaughters to be in mortal danger. Yeah, so let me just fly off in the sunset. Yeah. Is this Game of Thrones? No. That's what I like so much about Game of Thrones, that the, the characters have to be ruthless, so they think ahead and they do these things. Yes, and then yeah. when something unexpected happen, happens, we understand it, and it's mm. our fault for not, for not you know, seeing it coming. Mm. No. I think that he had this story beforehand that there was a civil war this dance of dragons and now he just like added the you know cool twists Mm -hmm. that all lead to where he already decided before he wrote any of this that there is a civil war and the targaryens eventually collapse Mm. so now look ah twist 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 (laughs) twist okay but if you add all these uh, twist twist twists then w- it says that shit happens. Yeah. Ten episodes of shit happens. Yeah, and still some seasons to go as well. How many seasons <laughs> are commissioned? I don't three, know. Three, two, three, three. I don't know. I don't know, but like, there's more coming, obviously. What do you think is uh, Rhaenerys' arc? 
her character arc throughout the seasons. The two actresses. Uh, uh, I don't get it. Uh, at, yeah. I thought she was going to be Daenerys and then she wasn't. And also like now, what was exactly the point of the stillbirth now? Wow. Other than to show that she was very upset. I think it's just like uh, there is, she doesn't have a future. But this is like, you know, yeah. woman's exploitation. Three births, four births, painful. And sh- like I skipped all the baby parts where they showed the baby. It's just like 30 seconds ahead, 30 seconds ahead. What the, sh- what the hell was that? What the hell was that? Yeah. Right. A dead yeah. baby? Are you insane? Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. This is like uncool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then let's talk about all the gratuitous bullshit. Like why the food fetish? Food fetish? Ah, right in the uh, episode uh, nine. <laughs> it's like, why all of a sudden that dude needs to jerk off over the princess's feet? The like, queen's what, feet. Yeah. What, what? That was just gratuitous. That was right. literally just gratuitous. Right. It's just like an anecdote again. <laughs> this guy has a food fetish. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Yeah. People have food fetishes. Yeah. He, he's got a foot handicap, and he's got a foot fetish. Uh, poetic justice, and he's like gross. Like, yeah. And it's gross. It's like, like you know, the evil cripple, uh, sinister cripple guy. This is, this is, a, this is a gross, yeah. you know, portrayal. It's like a cartoonish. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's like an anti-Semitic trope about about you know disabled people. That's uh, that's that's also like why in Game of Thrones it's so much better with Tyrion Lannister, who is a dwarf and kind of an evil genius, but he's actually he does pretty well with the ladies, and it turns out he knows how to fuck. And that's more like a balanced yeah. character, like to make him also like if he was creepy or like a pedo or something like, okay, that's a bit on the yes. nose. But yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And the beautiful people, you know? Jamie and Cersei, they are actually, you know, rotten from the inside. So, okay, that's interesting. Right. Yes. But to make the handicapped person also be a pervert. <laughs> uh, okay. And just like the evilest person. He's just like, he, he looks like pure evil. And also just like what, what, what exactly was the valuable information that he revealed so that he could get, uh, get the wank in return? Like, he, oh, do you know that there are spies in the Red I Keep? I didn't understand anything about, about this guy. Well, the, like the, wow, that's a big revelation. Uh, you get to look at my feet in return. Thank you for telling me there are spies. Like that, like that part was also just incongruous. Like it, yeah. <laughs> So <laughs> it's interesting. So we read a lot of uh, reviews, right, about the show. And I just like, w- uh, like listen to just a little bit of content about what people say about the show and just like what people around me say. Mm-hmm. And like the consensus opinion is, I would say like this. It's good. Yeah. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> but then if you push back just a little... No, yeah. yeah, you're right, you're right. But it's just like, like everybody's like trying to not hurt the show's feelings or something. Yeah. It's like, no, no, it was okay. It's, it's not like Game of Thrones, but you know, no, no, some really, yeah. 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 Why? Wow, well, damning with faint praise. <laughs> <laughs> and we read all these reviews, New York Times, The Guardian, basically a recap. First, this character does this, yeah. then the character does that. And then, and then, and then, and then. <laughs> Like, like I think it's like the emperor's. Uh, the emperor has no clothes. Uh, situation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and the opposite with Rings of Power. Like the 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 rating that it gets on IMDb is obviously like angry incels who are downvoting it because I don't know it's too woke or something. Uh, like it, yeah, it, it's it's not that bad. Just like this is not that good. <laughs> uh, I think that Rings of Power is more than uh, not just bad. Like this precisely, yeah. No, it's actually I, I enjoy it. You know, maybe you, uh, some people would want to have this story not as a legend, but it's a story about how like how powerful people use power, view themselves, view the others, and how that creates disaster for many many people. But uh, you know, Galadriel and Elrond, we know that they will survive. <laughs> Everybody else there is going to die. So it's of no consequence to the elite. That's one story. And this story is things happened when, uh, I guess, also people have a lot of power. When, when you have a lot of power concentrated with a few people, then a lot of things could go wrong. Yeah, yeah? I guess this is a story. Yeah. And then a lot of things do go wrong. 
Yeah. Nothing goes good. <laughs> Nothing goes right. No. Right? Nobody gets a break. <laughs> No, it's a comedy of errors. Without the comedy, why isn't there a, a comedy <laughs> at all? Game of Thrones was, fun, was funny also. Yeah. So gloomy. Okay, yeah. okay. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We've gotten some uh, good uh, feedback from our patrons. That they enjoy yes. listening to, uh, to our breakdowns. And I guess, I guess we'll take a, a month off, something like that, and then we'll go back. Something like that. And then we go back to uh, As Depicted on Film. As Depicted on Film. So we'll be back in December. Sounds good. Tell your friends. Yes. Th- this is a cool podcast. Yeah. With good content. Yeah. A good call finally mentioned that there actually is a Patreon. <laughs> 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 Patreon.com slash A-D-O-F. I won't read it aloud. A-D-O-F. There's an L missing. No. Uh, <laughs> A-D-O-F. <laughs> As depicted on film. Cool. Okay, mm? that's what it means. <laughs> I got, got it. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of a circle back, right, to how we started this episode. <laughs> oh, this is like a, <laughs> a an coincidence. Easter egg. Yeah. <laughs> coincidence. I'm sure it's a coincidence. Yeah, that's very okay. <laughs> so thank you everybody for listening, and we'll see you in December. Yes. See ya. Bye everybody. Bye. Nice. <laughs>